Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now, one of the comments I read quite often attached to my YouTube videos, particularly videos that touch on Android performance or on iOS in some way, is that Android isn't optimized. Now, why do people write that? Why do people make those comments on my YouTube videos? And is there any truth to it? Well, let me explain. So why do people make these comments that Android isn't optimized? Well, I think there are, there are two reasons. I think the first reason is that somewhere deep in people's minds, whenever they read something that talks about how a different phone other than an Android phone could actually be doing a good job, they kind of have a, you know, kind of a mental crisis and they have to come up with an answer to why that particular phone could be better than the phone that they have. And somewhere deep down in the, in the psychology, people say, oh, it's because Android is not optimized. Maybe they're thinking that if it was optimized, if they, the next version of Android that comes out or, or something's gonna happen magically, it's gonna make my phone better than this other phone. I think also there's an element to it of the kind of whole idea that Apple have been portraying for years, even before the iPhone uh, came out, and that is that it just works. This idea of a tightly integrated system, which of course we found first of all in the Mac, Apple controlled the software, the hardware, the ecosystem, and that kind of model they carried on forward into the iPhone. Whereas of course Android comes from a whole variety of different manufacturers. You've got Sony and Samsung and HTC and LG and Huawei and loads of others and they all use processors from MediaTek and Qualcomm and Huawei and Samsung and their displays from different places and they're a different version of Android and people talk about Android fragmentation and it kind of gives this idea or way of kind of things like chaos and, and, and not a coherence at all and that leads to the idea that it's not optimised whereas Apple is just optimized because it's just one phone from one manufacturer with one hardware, one software, and it's all meant to be tightly knit together. Well, is that true? Well, let's have a look. So the first thing we have to look at is the different programming languages that are used for iOS and for Android, because one of the accusations that are often thrown at Android is that it uses Java. And Java has to use a virtual machine because it uh, uses an intermediate language called the Java bytecode, which is interpreted at runtime on the phone. Whereas iOS uses native apps. You, you use an Objective-C or a Swift compiler and it produces direct machine code which runs on the phone. Therefore, uh, Android is slow, it's unoptimized, whereas iOS is sleek and it's fast. Well, that's really actually not true. And there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, on a normal app, for example, let's say I'm using the Gmail app, the app spends most of its time actually just waiting for me to press something. It's not kind of doing intensive computing tasks. It's not kind of, you know, calculating all these immensely difficult things. It's actually just waiting for me to tap something. And then when I tap something, it actually then waits for the network to respond. So if I'm using a 3G connection or a 4G connection, or, I, or you know, I've got to wait for the data to come over the network and then come back to my phone before it can display something. So apps actually spend most of their time waiting for user input or waiting for the network. And the majority of Productivity apps don't do much in the terms of calculations. I mean, there's not much calculation or CPU power going into displaying email, for example. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, there is a native development kit available for Android where you can write programs in C and C++. And if you play any kind of game based on Unity or based on the Unreal Engine, and there's probably several others as well, they're actually just native apps. They're not running in Java, they're running uh, C that's been compiled down to machine code because you couldn't do all that 3D stuff uh, in Java. You really have to do it for the best performance in C. So at the end of the day, when these benchmarks are running, and I actually contacted Geekbench about this, I asked the people at Geekbench, when you run a benchmark, are we trying to compare Java on Android and Objective-C on uh, an Apple phone? They said, no, both of them are actually written in C and they're both compiled using the respective uh, tool chain, so you get the same code running on both Android and running on, on iOS. So it's not a debate about Java versus C or native versus Java, that's just actually not true. Another thing that's interesting is that actually 
Android has developed its virtual machine significantly over the years. I mean, Android's been in development since before 2008. And if you compare Android 2.x to Android 7 that we have today, I mean, there's a huge difference between them. And the code has been modified and changed and, and, and it's been made better. For example, we've seen these new changes with the uh, art uh, virtual machine and actually there's so much compiling that goes on beforehand so that actually the Java apps are turned into native apps but it does that actually in the phone when you install the app and if you look at my Java versus C performance video that I've done on this channel you will see that while C is faster it Java isn't so terribly slow that actually it's just it's just laughable actually the difference between Java and C is actually not as far apart as we might think now there's also the other interesting thing is that actually large parts of Android itself are written in C and not in Java. For example, the Linux kernel, which is part of Android, is completely written uh, in C. And there are other parts of the Android frameworks and other parts of Android subsystems that are all written in C. So it's not as if we're waiting for Java for absolutely everything that goes on. There's lots of C and native machine code that's running when an Android app runs. So then there's a question of, does Apple add some hardware optimizations that aren't available, for example, in uh, Android? Things that can happen in hardware and therefore happen quicker that Android isn't able to do. Now, there's probably some truth to this. However, getting to the bottom of it is a little difficult. Now, let me explain. Um, Apple have what's called an architectural license from ARM, which means they're allowed to design their own CPUs. They've got their own engineers and they don't actually ask ARM for anything. They just say, we're going to design an ARM compatible CPU. Now, that compatibility is verified by a set of tests that they have to run provided by ARM that when they run them, they get the results that says this is an ARM compatible CPU core. But the question that's kind of floating around, uh, and I've been I've asked people this in, in kind of tech conferences and so on, is does Apple add extra instructions to the CPU? Because the tests, as far as I know, can't test for extra instructions. They can only test that a standard uh, ARM program will run on that uh, new CPU without failing and that it ad adheres to the specifications of the instruction set. Now, let me give you an example. In ARM v7, there was no cryptographic instructions for doing uh, AES uh, cryptography. And when ARM invented ARM v8, they added in these instructions. So that now when you do AES cryptography on an ARM 64-bit ARM uh, processor, it's actually loads times faster, like seven or eight times faster than it would be on a 32-bit ARM v7 architecture because there are these extra instructions that are very useful for doing uh, the cryptography kind of operations. So maybe Apple have analyzed their own operating system, maybe they've analyzed their own SDKs and they say, hey, if we had an instruction that did this, that could give us a 5% increase. If we had another instruction that did this, that could give us another 5% increase, and they may have added that to their silicon. Now that is possible. Now the problem is the compilers that uh, our Apple use are open source, and when we look at the compilers, we don't see uh, immediately anyway, we don't see that there are extra instructions that are being being produced by this compiler. Now, could it be that Apple have their own in-house compilers for compiling iOS itself? That's also possibly true. So we have anecdotal evidence that Apple could be doing this, but actually nothing, nothing concrete. Now, a second way that Apple could be actually boosting things in hardware is to create a specific type of execution engine that's very good at doing a certain thing. Now, we actually already have those in all SOCs from Apple and from Qualcomm and Samsung and, and whoever, because the GPU and DSPs and image processors are exactly that. They are bits of discrete hardware on the chips that are good at doing certain things. Hey, you want a, a something encoded in a particular video codec? Well, ask the video encoder to do it, and that's done in, in, in hardware. So Apple could be adding in something else that says, hey, we know that we do a lot of this kind of stuff in our in our operating system. So if we had a piece of hardware that did it, then it would be really good. And you just load up the kind of the, the data and you say to that bit of hardware, go and execute and, and, and process that. Now that could be very well true and that could be buried into the SDK so that when an app developer writes an app, the SDK automatically calls that execution unit to do that kind of thing. 
But here's the interesting thing, you see, because Qualcomm uh, and others can do exactly the same thing. If you look at a Qualcomm Snapdragon CPU, it's full of different components, including the DSP and an ISP and, and the GPU and the SDKs that they provide allow you to call those uh, functions. In fact, Qualcomm have what's called the Hexagon DSP SDK, which allows apps writers to, to, to compile apps and optimize them for Qualcomm processors and the DSP can not, does more than just digital signal processing which was what it original was used for. Now it can even do image processing, it can do recognition, it can do some kind of VR and AR and it's really a complicated kind of dedicated piece of hardware that does specialist functions. So if Apple are doing that we can also be sure that people like Qualcomm and Samsung are also doing that as well. So what about system integration? Every piece of hardware needs a piece of software. So Apple designed the, uh, the processor for their phone, but they also have to design the software. And because they are working for the same company and there's a great level of coherence between these two teams, obviously they're working very closely to make sure the software and the hardware work together very well. And that can't be true in the Android world because there's all these different OEMs, all these different uh, SOC makers and all this. Well, actually it's not quite like that. For example, ARM, when they license some of their intellectual property like let's say the Cortex-A73 core to someone like Huawei or the Cortex-A53 core to someone like MediaTek, they have to provide them with the software that goes with it because there's a whole bunch of stuff that's needed also for the GPUs and for the CPUs. There's a whole bunch of software. Now, now those companies could write all that software themselves, but there, there's very little point. ARM are specialists at working with their own hardware, so they sell hardware and software to these SOC makers. So that when the SOC maker then produces a, a, a chip, actually it has the right drivers and the right software. And of course, it's in ARM's absolute benefit that those drivers are optimized, absolutely essential that it gets the best performance through that software. So there are loads of software engineers at ARM who work on just making the Android software. And likewise, if you're a company like Qualcomm, of course, who design their own core sometimes, who got their own GPU, they have their own people, just like Apple do and just like ARM do, who write their own software to make sure the drivers, the integration with Android is at its most efficient. Otherwise, it's pointless them spending millions and millions of dollars developing the latest Snapdragon processor and then they've got no software for it and in fact they're losing 30% of their performance through some bad software. That just doesn't happen. They've got equal investment in the software and in the hardware. And what about Android itself? Maybe people think the Android operating system is somehow just kind of this woolly blob that doesn't really have any optimization. Well again, that's not true because first of all, it's open source, which means that of course, lots of people have looked at the code and I've looked at the code. Lots of people have made changes to it. Lots of people work on the Linux kernel and there's loads of different stuff that are going on. ARM themselves contribute loads of code to the Linux kernel specifically for ARM processors and specifically for mobile. Then of course, you've got uh, Qualcomm and you've got Samsung and you've got uh, all these other companies, Sony and HTC and LG, they all have to build Android themselves for their phones and it doesn't take too much of a brilliant engineer to do a quick test to say, hey, this is running slowly on our piece of hardware, let's find out why. Oh look, there's an optimization we can do here. That's not really rocket science for engineers who do this thing absolutely every day. So there's been loads of engineering eyes who've actually been studying the code and looking at it to find out whether there are any optimizations that can be done. Now that's kind of code level optimization, but what about system level? You know, how the whole thing is put together from the kernel and the drivers and the frameworks and the, the, the Java virtual machine and the apps on top of that. How is that all optimized? Well, think about who writes it. We're talking about Google here. Now, Google are brilliant at doing system integration. I mean, Gmail, YouTube, <laughs> Google search. I mean, none of these things could work properly with all the millions of requests per second, all the video that's being streamed constantly. That just would all fall apart if Google were no do good at doing system integration. But they are good at doing system integration. That's why they've got thousands and thousands of servers and huge server rooms and just terabytes and terabytes of, of hard disk and it's all optimized at the system level to develop and to deliver the most uh, efficient uh, a video and email and search results because otherwise their business would just go bankrupt. 
So therefore, of course, Google engineers have that knowledge. And the idea that the Android team can't do that kind of thing as well is just, is just plainly absurd. So where does that leave us? Well, basically, it means that Android is optimized. It's optimized at a system level because Google know how to put together a system. It's optimized at the code level because so many different engineers have looked at the code. It's optimized by every OEM. You think Samsung are gonna spend loads of money on developing the latest handset and then find it crippled by some bad software. That's not gonna happen. They got software engineers working on that. But why do we still have this question that Apple uh, products are more uh, integrated? Well, again, it goes back to what I think I said at the beginning. There is this kind of story put out by uh, Apple that it just works, that the integrated approach is the best approach where they control the hardware and the software and the ecosystem. But really, of course, it actually comes down to this. There's only ever one iPhone per year, whereas there are hundreds of Android phones. And that dedication, that focus on bringing out just one phone kind of leads people to believe that they've, Apple has put all their efforts into doing this one thing and they're not distracted by doing other things. Whereas Android seems to be chaotic, seems to be so many handsets, so many different things. And surely that must be better than that. Well, actually, it is not true because companies like Samsung, companies like uh, LG and other companies like that just wouldn't be able to survive if they didn't have an optimized solution for Android. Well, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this video. I really look forward to hearing your comments below. Just one thing, if you are gonna comment and say things like, yeah, but Android isn't optimized, give me some proof. Show me something that tells you that Android isn't optimized. Show me the code, point to me to an area where you can say, I know this isn't optimized, I'd really like to know. If it's just a, a woolly idea that you've got, well, I hope this video has corrected your, your woolly thinking. Please don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. Also, please do download the Android Authority app because that will give you access to all of our news and stories directly on your mobile phone. And last but not least, please go over to androidauthority.com because we are your source for all things Android.